where the red fern grows, day seven. I, <clears throat> Grandpa asked, what happened? I told him the coon had probably pulled some kind of trick. Coming up to my dogs, we saw they were working up and down an old rail fence. We stood and watched. Every now and then, old Dan would rear up on a large hackberry tree that was standing about seven feet from the fence and bald treed. As yet, little Ann had not bald the treed bark. We watched her. She was working everywhere. She climbed up on the rail fence and followed its zigzag course until she disappeared in the darkness. I told Papa I was sure the coon had walked the rail fence and in some way had fooled my dogs. Old Dan would keep coming back to the hackberry tree. He would rear up on it and bald treed. We walked up to him. Looking the tree over, we could see that the coon wasn't in it. The judge said, it looks like he has them fooled. Maybe you'd better call them off, Grandpa said. We can go someplace else and hunt. We've got to get one more coon, even if I have, try, have to tree it myself. For some reason, no one laughed at his remark. It's almost daylight, Papa said. Yes, that's what has me worried, I said. We don't have time to do any more hunting. If we lose this one, we're beat. Hearing the word beat, Grandpa began to fidget. He asked me, what do you think happened? How did that coon fool them? I don't know for sure, I said. He walked that rail fence. The hackberry tree has something to do with this trick, but I don't know what. Son, the judge said, I wouldn't feel too badly if I were you. I've seen some of the very best hounds fooled by a smart old coon. Regardless of all the discouraging talk, the love and belief I had in my little red hounds never faltered. I could see them now and then, leaping over old logs, tearing through the underbrush, sniffing and searching for the lost trail. My heart swelled with pride. I whooped, urging them on. In a low voice, the judge said, I'll say one thing. They don't give up easily. Birds began to chirp all around us. The sky took on a light gray color. Tiny dim stars were blinking the night away. It looks like we're beat, Papa said. It's getting daylight. At that moment, the loud, clear voice of a red bone hound bald tree rang through the river bottoms. It was the voice of little Anne. Sucking in a mouthful of air, I held it. I could feel my heart pounding against my ribs. I closed my eyes tight and gritted my teeth to keep the tears from coming. Let's go get them, Grandpa said. No, wait a minute, I said. Why? Wait till old Dan gets there, I said. It's daylight now, and if we walk up to the tree, the coon will jump out. It's hard to keep a coon in a tree after daylight. Let's wait until old man gets there. Then, if he jumps, he won't have a chance to get away. The boy's right, the judge said. It's hard to keep a coon in a tree after daybreak. Just then, we heard old Dan. His deep voice shattered the morning silence. Searching for the lost trail, he had crossed the fence and worked his way out into an old field. Turning around, we saw him coming. He was a red blur in the gray morning shadows. Coming to the rail fence, and without breaking his stride, he raised his body into the air. About halfway over, and while still in the air, he bawled. Feeding the ground with a loud grunt, he ran past us. Everyone whooped to him. The head was a deep washout about ten feet wide. On the other side was a cane break. His long red body, stretched to its fullest length, seemed to float in the air as he sailed over it. We could hear the tall stalks rattling as he plowed. As he, pl as he plowed his way through them. A bunch of sleepy snowbirds rose from the thick cane, flitted over, and settled in a row on the rail, old rail fence. Near in the tree, we could see it was a tall sycamore, and there, high in the top, was the coon. Grandpa threw a fit. He hopped around, whooping and hollering. He threw his old hat down on the ground and jumped up and down on it. Then he ran over and kissed little Ann right on the head. After we killed and skinned the coon, the judge said, Let's walk back to that old fence. I think I know how the old fellow pulled his trick. Back at the fence, the judge stood and looked around for a few minutes, smiling. He said, yes, that's how he did it. How? Grandpa asked. Still smiling, the judge said, that old coon walked the rail fence. Coming even with the hackberry tree, he leaped on its side and climbed up. Notice how thick the timber is around here. See that limb up there in the top, the one that runs over and almost touches the sycamore? We saw what he meant. The coon walked out on that limb, he said, leapt over and caught the sycamore limb. Repeating this over and over from tree to tree, he worked his way far out into the river bottoms. What I can't figure out is how that hound found him. Gazing at little Ange, he shook his head and said, I've been hunting coons and judging coon hunts for 40 years, but I've never seen anything like that. He looked at me. Well, son, he said, you have tied the leading teams. There's only one more night of eliminations. Even if some of them get more than three coons, you'll still be in the runoff. And from what I've seen here tonight, you have a good chance of winning the cup. I knew the little Ange had scented the coon in the air, the same as she had the ghost coon. I walked over and knelt down beside her. The things I wanted to say to her I couldn't, for the knot in my throat, but I'm sure she understood. As soon as we came uh, as we came into the campground, the hunters came out of their tents and gathered around us. The judge held out the three big coon hides. There was a roar from the crowd. One man said, that was the most beautiful sight I've ever seen. What was a beautiful sight? Grandpa asked. Last night, those little red hounds brought that coon right through camp. The judge said, we figured they did when we heard the noise. Laughing, the man said, we heard them when they ran up the other side of the river. Way up above here, they crossed over. We could tell that they were coming back, so we doused all the fire fires, and sure enough, they came right through camp. Those two little hounds were, were 50 yards behind the coon, running side by side. Boy, were they 
picking them up and laying them down and bawling every time their feet touched the ground. I tell you, it was the prettiest sight I ever saw. When the judge started telling about the last little coon little ant had treated, I took my dogs over to our tent and fed and watered them. After they had their fill, I gave them a good rub down with a piece of gunny sack. Taking them out to the buggy, I tied them up. I stood and watched while they twisted around in the hay, making their bed. That day, I tried to get some sleep in our tent, but the soaking Grandpa had taken in the river had given him a cold, causing him to snore. I never heard such a wreck in all my life. I swore he rattled the paper sacks in our grocery boxes. Taking a blanket, I went out to my dogs. Little Ann had wiggled up as close to old Dan as she could. <clears throat> Crying them apart, I lay down between them and fell asleep. The last night of the eliminations turned out like the second night. None of the judges turned in more than two hides. That day, about noon, the owners of the other winning teams and I were called for a conference with the head judge. He said, gentlemen, the eliminations are over. Only three sets of hounds are left for the runoff. The winner of tonight's hunt will receive the gold cup. If there is a tie for the championship, naturally, there will be another runoff. He shook hands with each of us and wished us good luck. Tension began to build up in the camp. Here and there, hunters were standing in small groups talking. Others could be seen going in and out of tents with rolls of money in their hands. Grandpa was the busiest one of all, of all. His voice could be heard all over camp. Men were looking at me and taking in low tone, talking in low tones. I started like a turkey gobbler. That evening, while we were having supper, a hunter dropped by. He had a small box in his hand. Smiling, he said, everyone has agreed that we should have a jackpot for the winner. I've, picked to do, I've been picked to do the collecting. Grandpa said, you may as well leave it here now. Looking at me, the hunter said, son, I think almost every man in this camp is hoping you win it. But it's not going to be easy. You're going up against four of the finest hounds there are. Turning to my father, he said, did you know the two big walker hounds have won four gold cups? Very seriously, Papa said, you know I have two mules down on my place. One is... Is almost as big as a barn. The other one isn't much bigger than a jack rabbit, but that little mule can outpull the big one every time. Smiling, the hunter turned to leave. He said, you could be right. Papa asked me again where I thought we should start hunting. i had been thinking about this all day. I said, you remember where we jumped the last coon in the swamp? Papa said, yes. Well, the way I figure, more than one coon lives in that swamp. I said, it's a good place for them as there are lots of crawfish and minnows in those potholes. If a hound jumps one there, he has a good chance to tree him. Papa asked, why? It's a long way back to the river and about the same distance to the mountains, I said. Either way he runs, the dog can get pretty close to him, and so he would have to take to a tree. That evening, we climbed up into Grandpa's buggy and headed for the swamp. It was dark by the time we reached it. Grandpa handed Papa his gun, saying, you're getting to be a pretty good shot with this thing. I hope I get to shoot it a lot tonight, Papa said. Under my breath, I said, I do too. After untying the ropes from my dogs, I held onto their collars for a minute. Pulling them up close, I knelt down and whispered, This is the last night. I know you'll do your best. They seemed to understand and tugged at their collars. When I turned them loose, they started for the timber. Just as they reached the dark shadows, they stopped, turned around, and stared straight at me for an instant. The judge saw their strange actions. Laying a hand on my shoulder, he asked, What did they say, son? I said, Nothing that anyone could understand. But I can feel that they know this hunt is important. They know it just as well as you and I. It was little Ann who found the trail. Before the echo of her sharp cry had died away, old Ann's deep voice floated out of the swamp. Well, let's go, Papa said eagerly. No, let's wait a minute, I said. Wait, why? Grandpa asked. To see which way he's going to run, I said. Coon broke out of the swamp and headed for the river. Listening to my dogs, I could tell they were close to him. I said to Papa, I don't think he'll ever make it to the river. They're right on his heels now. By the time we had circled the swamp, they were bawling tree. The judge said, boy, that was fast. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. Looking at me, he smiled and nodded his head. Papa and I knew I had to judge the coon perfectly. He didn't have time to reach the river to, or the mountains. My dogs had treed the coon in a tall ash, which stood about 50 yards from the river. I knew the 50 yards had saved us a good hour, because <coughs> he could have pulled trick after trick if he had gotten in the water. We spied the coon in the topmost branches. At the crack of the gun, he ran far out on a limb and jumped. He landed in an old fallen treetop. He scooted through it. Coming out the other side, he ran for the river. The tangled mass of limbs slowed my dogs, and they all but tore the treetop apart getting out of it. The coon was just one step ahead of them as they reached the river. We heard them hit the water. Running over, we stood and watched the fight. The coon was at home in the river. He crawled up on old Dan's hand, trying to force him under. Before he could do it, little Ann reached up and pulled him off. In a scared voice, Papa said, That water looks deep to me. Maybe you had better call them off, said the judge. That's a big coon, and he could drown one of them easily in that deep water. Call them off, I said. Why? You couldn't whip them off with a stick. There's no use for anyone to get scared. They know exactly what they're doing. I've seen this more times than one. Grandpa was scared and excited. He was jumping up and down, whooping and howling. Papa raised the gun to aim. I jumped and grabbed his arm. Don't do that, I yelled. You're sure to hit one of my dogs. Round and round in the deep water, the fight went on. 
The coon climbed up on Old Dan's head and sank his teeth in one of his long, tender ears. Old Dan bawled with pain. Little Ann swam in and caught one of the coon's hind legs in her mouth. She tried hard <coughs> to pull him off. All three disappeared under the water. I held my breath. The water churned and boiled. All three came to the top about the same time. The coon was between the bank we were standing on and my dogs. He swam toward us. I caught him again just as he reached the shore. He fought his way free and ran for a large sycamore. Old Dan caught him just as he started up. I knew that was the end of the fight. After it was all over and the coon had been skinned, Grandpa said, I hope we don't have to go through that again tonight. For a while, I sure thought your dogs were goners. The judge said, well, have you ever seen that? Look over there. Old Dan was standing perfectly still with his eyes closed and head hanging low, head hanging down. Little Ann was looking at his cut and bleeding ears. She always does that, I said. If you'll watch when she gets done with him, he'll do the same for her. We stood and watched until they had finished doctoring each other. Then trotting side by side, they disappeared into the darkness. We followed along, stopping now and then to listen. Chapter 17. Looking up in, the, in the, up the sky, Papa said, That doesn't look good up there. I think we're in for a storm. The sky had turned a dark gray. Fast-moving clouds were rolling through the heavens. Grandpa said, Looks like we're going to get some wind, too. Scared and thinking everyone might want to stop hunting because of a few clouds, I said, If a storm is brewing, it's a good night to hunt. All game stirs just before a storm. Thirty minutes later, Papa said, Listen. We stood still. Low mo a low moaning sound could be heard in the tops of the tall sycamores. Grandpa said, I was afraid of that. We're going to get some wind. We heard a rattling in the leaves and underbrush. It was beginning to sleep. The air turned cold and chilly. From far down river, we heard the deep bang of a hound on a trail. It was old Dan. Seconds later, the rhythmic crying of little Ann could be heard. Swallowing the lump that had jumped up in my throat, I whooped as loud as I could. The ground was turning white with sleep. The storm had really set in. We hurried along. I said to Papa, if this keeps up, that old coon won't run long. He'll head for his den. If it gets much worse, Grandpa said, I know some coon hunters that won't be running very long. They'll be frozen too stiff to run. The judge asked if there was any danger of getting lost. I don't know, Papa said. It's all strange country to me. My dog's voices sounded far away. I knew they were much closer than they sounded, sounded as they were downwind from us. Finding three large sycamores growing closer, close together, we stopped on the leeward side. Papa shouted above the wind, I don't know if we can take much more of this. It is bad, Grandpa replied, and it looks like it's going to get worse. You can't see over 15 feet now, the judge said. Do you think we can find the buggy? I think we can find the buggy, all right, Papa said. I can no longer hear the voices of my dogs. This had me worried. I didn't want to leave them out in the storm. Can anyone hear the hounds? Grandpa asked. I can't, Papa said. The judge spoke up. Fellows, I think we'd better go in, he said. There's no telling where they are. They may have crossed the river. Scared of knowing I had not had to do something, I said, they're closer than you think, probably treed by now. We can't hear them for this wind. I was like, let's go a little further. There was no reply. No one made a move to leave the shelter of the trees. Taking the few steps, I said, I'll take the lead. Just follow me. Billy, we couldn't find them, Papa said. We can't see or hear a thing. We had better start back for camp. I think so, too, the judge said. At this remark, I cried, I've been out in storms like this before all by myself. I've never left my dogs in the woods, and I'm not going to now, even if I have to look for them myself. No one answered. Please go just a little further, I begged. I know we'll, we'll hear them. Still, no one spoke or made a move to go on. Stepping over to my father, I buried my face in his old Mackinac coat. Sobbing, I pleaded with him not to turn back. He patted my head. Billy, he said, a man could freeze to death in this storm. And besides, your dogs will give up and come in. That's what has me worried, I cried. They won't come in. They won't, Papa. Little Ann might but not old Dan. He'd die before he'd leave a coon in a tree. Papa was undecided. Making up his mind, he stepped away from the tree and said to the others, I'm going on with him. You fellas coming, or are you going back? He turned and followed me. Grandpa and the judge fell in behind him. By this time, the ground was covered with a thin white layer of sleet. We kept slipping and falling and could hear Grandpa mumbling and grumbling. The wind-driven sleet stung our skin like thousands of pricking needles. Strong gusts of wind growled and moaned through the tops of the tall timber. Once during a momentary lull of the storm, I thought I heard the bang of a hound. I told my father I had, I had heard old Dan. From which direction, he asked. From that way, I said, pointing to our left. We started on. A few minutes later, Papa stopped. He shouted to my grandfather, did you hear anything? No, Grandpa shouted back. I can't hear anything in this storm. I thought I did, but I'm not sure, the judge said. Where is it coming from, Papa asked. Over that way, the judge said, pointing to our right. That's the way it sounded to me, Papa said. At that moment, all of us heard the deep voice of old Dan. Sounds as if they're close, Papa said, or Grandpa said. Let's split up, said the judge. Maybe one of us can find them. No, Papa said. It'd be easy to get lost in this storm. I think they're more to the right of us, I said. I do too, Papa said. We trudged on. Old Dan bawled again. The sound of his voice seemed to be all around us. 
The way that wind is whipping, the sound through this timber, the judge said, we'd be lucky if we ever found them. Papa shouted over the roar of the wind. We can't take much more of this. We'll freeze to death. The men were giving up. I felt the knot again as my, it crawled up in my throat. I saw a lot of froze on my eyelashes. Kneeling down, I put my ear close to the icy ground in hopes I could hear my dogs, but I couldn't hear anything above the roar of the blizzard. Standing up, I peered this way and that. All I could see was a white wall of whirling sleep. I closed my eyes and said a silent prayer and hoped for a miracle. We heard a sharp crack and a loud crashing noise. A large limb torn from a tree by the storm, strong wind fell to the ground. The sharp crack of the limb gave me the idea. Shouting to my father, I said, shoot the gun. If my dogs are close enough to hear it, maybe the little animal will come to us. Papa doesn't has, didn't hesitate. Pointing the gun high over his head, he pulled the trigger. The sharp crack rang out into the teeth of the storm. We waited. Just when I had given up all hope and had sunk to the lowest depth of, my, of despair, out of the white wall of driving sleep, my little dog came to me. I knelt down and gathered her in my arms. Taking one of the lead ropes from my pocket, I tied it to her collar. I said, find him, little girl. Please find old Dan. Right then, I didn't care about coons, gold cups, or anything. All I wanted was my dogs. I don't know how she did it. Straight into the face of the storm, she led us. Time after time, she would stop and turn her head this way and that. I knew she couldn't scent or see anything. Instinct alone was guiding her. Over a winding and twisting trail, we followed. Coming out of the bottom, she led us into a thick cane break. The tall stalks sheltered us from the storm. The roaring of the wind didn't seem as loud. Like ghostly figures, large trees loomed out of the almost solid mass. Falling and stumbling, we kept pushing on. Grandpa shouted, hold up a minute. I'm just all about all in. We stopped. Do you think that hound knows what she's doing? The judge asked. Maybe we're just running around in circles. Looking at me, Papa said, I hope she does. Some of these cane breaks cover miles. If we get lost in here, we'll be in bad shape. Grandpa said, I think we've gone too far. Last time I heard old Dan, he sounded quite close. That was because the wind carried the sound, I said. The judge spoke up. Fellows, no dog is worth the lives of three men. Now let's do the smart thing and get out of here while we can. Our clothes are wet. If we keep on wandering around in this jungle, we'll freeze to death. It doesn't look like this blizzard is ever going to let up. I could hear the roar of the blizzard back in the thick timber of the bottoms. Two large limbs being rubbed together by the strong wind made a grinding creaking sound. The tall, slender cane around us rattled and swayed. I could feel the silence closing in. I knew the judge's cold logic had had its effect on my father and grandfather. The men had given up. There was no hope left for me. Kneeling down, I put my arms around little Anne. I felt the warm heat from her moist tongue caressing my ear. Closing my eyes, I said, Please, Dan, ball one more time, just one more time. I waited for my plea to be answered. With its loud roaring, the north wind seemed to be laughing at us. All around, tall stalks of cane were weaving and dancing to the rattling rhythm of their knife-edged blades. My father tried to talk above the wind, but his words were lost in the storm. Just before another blast, clear as a foghorn, as on a stormy sea, old Dan's voice rang loud and clear. It seemed louder than the roar of the wind or the skeleton-like rustling of a tall swaying cane. I jumped to my feet. My heart did a complete flip-flop. The knot in my throat felt as big as an apple. I tried to whoop, but it was no use. Little Ann bawled and tugged on the rope. There was no mistake in the direction. We knew that little Ann had been right all along. Straight as an arrow, she had led us to him. Old Dan was treed down in a deep gully. I slid off the bank and ran to him. His back was covered with a layer of frozen sleet. His frost-covered whiskers stood, stood straight as por porcupine quills. I worked the wedges of ice from between his toes and scraped the sleep from his body with my hands. Little Ann came over and tried to wash his face. He didn't like it. Jerking loose from me, he ran over the tree, tree reared up, up on it, and started bawling. Hearing shouting from the bank above me, I looked up. I could dimly see Papa and the judge through the driving sleep. At first I thought they were shouting to me, but on peering closer I could see that they had their backs to me. Catching hold of some long stalks of cane that were hanging down from the steep bank, I pulled myself up. Papa shouted in my ear, something has happened to your grandfather. Turning to the judge, he said, he's behind you. When was the last time you saw him? I don't know for sure, the judge said. I guess it was back there when we heard the hound ball. Didn't you hear anything? Papa asked. Hear anything, the judge exclaimed. How could I hear anything in all that noise? I thought he was behind me all the time and didn't miss him until we got here. I couldn't hold back the tears. My grandfather was lost and wandering in that white jungle of cane. Screaming for him, I started back. Papa caught me. He shouted, don't do that. I tried to tear away from him, but his grip on my arm was firm. Shoot the gun, the judge said. Papa shot time after time. It was useless. We got no answer. Little Ann came up out of the washout. She stood and stared at me. Turning, she disappeared quickly in the thick cane. Minutes later, we heard her. It was a long, mournful cry. The only times I had ever heard my little dog ball like that were when she was baying at a bright Ozark moon or when someone played a French harp or fiddle close to her ear. She didn't stop until we reached her. Grandpa lay as he had, he had fallen. 
face down in the icy sleet. His right foot was wedged in the fork of a broken box elder limb. When the ankle had twisted, the sear searing pain must have made him unconscious. Papa worked Grandpa's foot free and turned him over. I sat down and placed his head in my lap. While Papa and the judge massaged his arms and legs, I wiped the frozen sleep from his eyes and face. Burying my face in his iron gray hair, I cried and begged God not to let my grandfather die. I think he's gone, the judge said. I don't think so, Papa said. He took a bad fall when that limb tripped him, but he hasn't been lying here for long, long enough to be frozen. I think he's just unconscious. Papa, Papa lifted him to a sitting position and told the judge to start slapping his face. Grandpa moaned and moved his head. He's coming around, Papa said. I asked Papa if we could get him back to the gully where old Dan was. I had noticed there was very little wind there and we could build a fire. That's the very place, he said. We'll build a good fire and one of us can go for help. Papa and the judge made a seat by catching each other's wrists. They eased Grandpa between them. By the time we reached the washout, Grandpa was fully conscious again of mumbling and grumbling. He couldn't see why they had to carry him like a baby. After easing him over the bank and down into the gully, we built a large fire. Papa took his knife and cut the boot from Grandpa's swollen foot. Grandpa grunted and groaned from the pain. I felt sorry for him, but there was nothing I could do but look on. Papa examined the foot, shaking his head. He said, boy, that's a bad one. It's either broken or badly sprained. I'll go for some help. Grandpa said, now just wait a minute. I'm not going to let you go out in that blizzard by yourself. What if something happens to you? No one would know. What time is it, he asked. The judge looked at his watch. It's almost five o'clock, he said. It's not long till daylight, Papa said, or Grandpa said. Then if you want to go, you can see where you're going. Now help me get propped up against this bank. I'll be all right. It doesn't hurt anymore. It's numb now. He's right, the judge said. Think you can stand it, Papa asked. Grandpa roared like a bear. Sure, I can stand it. It's nothing but a sprained ankle. I'm not going to die. Build that fire up a little more. While Papa and the judge made Grandpa comfortable, I carried wood for the fire. There's no use standing around and gawking at me, Grandpa said. I, I am all right. Get the coon out of that tree. That's what we came for, isn't it? Up until then, the coon hunting had practically been forgotten. The tree was almost 30 feet from the fire. We walked over and took a good look at it for the first time. My dog, seeing we were finally going to pay some attention to them, started bawling and running around the tree. Papa said, it's not much of a tree, just an old box elder snag. There's not a limb on it. I can't see any coon, said the judge. It must be hollow. Papa being on its side with the axe. It gave forth a loud booming sound. He said, it's hollow, all right. He stepped back a few steps, scraped his feet on the slick ground for a good footing, and said, stand back and hold those hounds. I'm going to cut it down. We need some good wood for our fire anyway. Squatting down between my dogs, I held on to their collars. Papa notched the old snag so it would be fall, it would fall away from our fire. As the heavy axe chewed its way into the tree, it began to lean and crack. Papa stopped chopping. He said to the judge, come on and help me. I think we can push it over now. After much grunting and pushing, snapping and popping, it fell. I turned my dogs loose. On hitting the ground, the snag split and broke, broke up. Goggle-eyed, I stood, rooted my tracks, and watched three big coons roll out of the busted old trunk. One started up the washout, running between us and the fire. Old Dan caught him and the fight was on. The second coon headed down the washout. Little Ann caught him. Hearing a loud yell from Grandpa, I looked that way. Old Dan and the coon were fighting close to his feet. He was yelling and beating at them with his hat. The judge and Papa ran to help. The third coon started climbing up the steep bank close to me. Just before reaching the top, his claws slipped in the icy mud. Tumbling end over end, down he came. I grabbed up a stick and threw it at him. Growling and showing his teeth, he started for me. I threw the fight to him then and there. Some ten yards away, I looked back. He was climbing the bank. That time, he made it and disappeared in the thick cane. Hearing a squall of pain from Little Ann, I turned. The coon was really working over. He had, a cl had climbed up on her back and was tearing and slashing. She couldn't shake him off. Grabbing a club from the ground, I ran to help her. Before we had killed our coon, old man came tearing in. We stood and watched the fight. When the coon was dead, Papa picked it up and we walked back to the fire. How many coons were in that old snag? Papa asked. I saw three, I said. The one that got away climbed out over there. I pointed in the direction of the coon had taken. I never should have pointed. My dogs turned as one. They started bawling and clawing their way up the steep bank. I shouted and scolded, but to no avail. They disappeared in the rattling cane. We stood listening to their voices. The sound died away in the roaring storm. Sitting down close to the fire, I buried my face in my arms and cried. I heard the judge say to my father, This beats anything I've ever seen. Why, those dogs can read that boy's mind. He just pointed at the bank, and away they went. I never saw anything like it. I can't understand some of the things they have done tonight. Hounds usually aren't that smart. If they were collies or some other breed of dog, it would be different. But they're just red bone hounds, hunting dogs. Papa said, yes, I know what you mean. I've seen them do things that I couldn't understand. I've never heard of hounds that have ever had any affection for anyone. But these dogs are different. Did you know they won't hunt with anyone but him, not even me? 
Hearing my grandfather call my name, I went over and sat down beside, by his side. Putting his arm around me, he said, Now, I wouldn't worry about those dogs. They'll be all right. It's not long till day, daylight. Then you can go to them. I said, Yes, but what if the coon crosses the river? My dogs will follow him. If they get wet, they could freeze to death. We'll just have to wait and hope for the best, he said. Now straighten up and quit that sniffling. Act like a coon hunter. You don't see me bawling, and this old foot is painting me something awful. I felt better after my talk with Grandpa. Come on, let's skin these coons, Papa said. I got up to help him. After the skins were peeled from the carcasses, I had an idea. Holding up one close to the fire until it was warm, I took it over and wrapped it around Grandpa's foot. Chuckling, he said, boy, that feels good. He ate another skin the same way. I kept it up for the rest of the night. Just before dawn, the storm blew itself out with one last angry roar. It started snowing. A frozen silence settled over the cane break. Back in the thick timber of the river bottoms, a sharp snapping of frozen limbs could be heard. The tall stalks of wild cane looked exhausted from the hellish night. They were dropping and bending from the weight of the frozen sleet. I climbed out of the deep gully and listened for my dogs. I couldn't hear them. Just as I started back down the bank, I heard something. I listened. Again, I heard the sound. Papa was watching me. Can you hear the dogs? He asked. No, not the dogs, I said, but I can hear something else. What does it sound like? Like someone whooping, I said. Papa and the lard and the judge hurried back up the bank. We heard the sound again. It was coming from a different direction. The first time I heard it, I said it was over that way. It's the men from camp, the judge said. They're searching for us. We started whooping. The searchers answered. Their voices came from all directions. The first one to reach us was Mr. Kyle. He looked haggard and tired. He asked if everything was all right. Yes, we are all right, Papa said, but the old man has a bad ankle. It looks like we'll have to carry him out. Their team broke loose and came back to camp about midnight, Mr. Carl said. This really spooked us. We were sure something bad had happened. Twenty-five of us have been searching since then. Several men climbed down the bank and went over to Grandpa. They looked at his ankle. One said, I don't think it's broken, but it sure is a bad sprain. You're in luck, another one said. We have one of the best doctors in the state of Texas in our camp, Dr. Charlie Latham. Lath <coughs> Lathman. He'll have you fixed up in no time. Yes, another said. And if I know Charlie, he's probably got a small hospital with him. Back in the crowd, I heard another man say, You mean that Latham fellow? Latham fellow who owns those black and tan hounds is a doctor? Sure is, another said, one of the best. Mr. Kyle asked where my dogs were. I told him that they were treed somewhere. What do you mean treed somewhere, he asked. Papa explained what had happened. With a wide-eyed look on his face, he said, You mean to tell me those hounds stayed with the tree in that blizzard? I nodded. Looking at me, he said, Son, I hope they have that coon tree because you need that one to win the cup. Those two walker hounds caught three before the storm came up. When it got bad, all hunters came in. The judge spoke up. I'll always believe that those hounds knew that boy needed another coon to win, he said. If you fellows had seen some of the things those dogs have done, you'd believe it too. One hunter walked over to the broken snag. Three out of one tree, he said. No wonder. Look here. That old snag was full, half full of leaves and grass. Why, it's a regular old den tree. Several of the men walked over. I heard one say, I've seen this happen before. Remember that big hunt in the red river bottoms when the two little beagle hounds treed four coons and a whole old hollow snag? They won the championship too. I wasn't there, but I remember reading about it, one said. Say, I don't see Benson, Mr. Kyle said. The men started looking at each other. He was searching farther down river than the rest of us, one fellow said. Maybe he didn't hear us shouting. Some of the men climbed out of the gully. They started whooping. From a distance, we heard we heard an answering of a shout. He hears us, someone said. He's coming. Everyone looked relieved. Mr. Benson struck the wash out a little way above us. He was breathing hard as if he'd been running. He started talking as soon as he was within hearing distance. It scared me when I first saw them, he said. I don't know what they were. They looked like white ghosts. I'd never seen anything like it. The hunter grabbed Mr. Benson by the shoulder, shaking him. Get a hold of yourself, man, he said. What are you talking about? Mr. Benson took a deep breath to control himself and started again in a much calmer voice. Those two hounds, he said. I found them. They're frozen solid. There's nothing but white ice from the tips of their noses to the ends of their tails. Hearing Mr. Benson's words, I screamed and ran to my father. Everything started whirling around and around. I felt light as a feather. My knees buckled. I knew no more. Regaining consciousness, I opened my eyes and could dimly see the blurry images of the men around me. A hand was shaking me. I could hear my father's voice, but I couldn't understand his words. Little by little, the blackness faded away. My throat was dry and I was terribly thirsty. I asked for some water. Mr. Benson came over. He said, son, I'm sorry, truly sorry. I didn't mean it that way. Your dogs are alive. I guess I was excited. I'm very sorry. I heard a deep voice say, that's a heck of a thing to do. Come running in here saying the dogs are frozen solid. Mr. Benson said, I didn't mean it to sound that way. I said, I'm sorry. What more do you want me to do? The deep voice growled again. I think it still was a heck of a thing for a man to do. 
Mr. Kyle took over. Now let's not have any more of this, he said. We have work to do. We've been standing here acting like a bunch of school kids. All this time that old man has been lying there suffering. A couple of you men cut two poles and make a stretcher to carry him. While the men were getting the poles, Papa heated the coonskins again and rewrapped Grandpa's foot. With belts and long leather laces from their boots, the hunters made a stretcher. Very gently, they put on Gra put Grandpa on it. Again, Mr. Kyle took command. Part of us will start for the camp with him. He said, the others will go after the dogs. Here, take this gun, Papa said. I'll go with him. Looking at me, Mr. Kyle said, come on, son. I want to see your hounds. Mr. Benson led the way. As soon as we get out of this cane, he said, we may be able to hear them. They have the coon tree in a bla big black gum tree. We're going to see a sight. Now I mean a sight. They've walked a ring around that tree, clear through the ice and snow. You can see the bare ground. Wonder why they did that, someone asked. I don't know, Mr. Benson replied. Unless they ran in that circle to keep from freezing to death, or to keep the coon in the tree. I figured I knew why my dogs were covered in this ice. The coon had probably crossed the river, maybe several times. Old Dan and little Ann would have followed him. They had come out of the river with their coats dripping wet, and the freezing blast of the blizzard had done the rest. Nearing the tree, we stopped and stared. Did you ever see anything like that? Mr. Benson asked. When I first saw them, I thought they were white wolves. My dogs hadn't seen us when we came up. They were trotting round and round, just as Mr. Benson had said. We could see the path they had worn down through the ice and snow until the bare black earth was visible. Like ghostly white shadows, around and around they trotted. In a low voice, someone said, They know that if they stop, they'll freeze to death. It's unbelievable, said Mr. Kyle. Come on, we must do something quick. With a choking sob, I ran for my dogs. On hearing our approach, they sat down and started bawling tree. I noticed their voice didn't have that solid ring. Their ice-covered tails made a rattling sound as they switched this way and that on the icy ground. A large fire was built. Setting my dogs close to the warm heat, the gentle hands of the hunters went to work. With the handkerchiefs and scrubs heated steaming hot, little by little the ice was thawed from their bodies. If they ever had lain down, someone said, they would have frozen to death. They knew it, another said. That's why they kept running in that circle. What I can't understand is why they stayed with the tree, Mr. Benson said. I've seen hounds stay with a tree for a while, but not in a northern blizzard. Men, said Mr. Kyle, people have been trying to understand dogs ever since the beginning of time. One never knows what they'll do. You can read every day where a dog saved the life of a drowning child or lay down his life for his master. Some people call this loyalty. I don't. I may be wrong, but I call it love, the deepest kind of love. After these words were spoken, a thoughtful silence settled over the men. The mood was broken by the deep, growling voice I had heard back in the washout. It's a shame that people all over the world can't have that kind of love in their hearts, he said. There would be no wars, slaughter, or murder, no greed or selfishness. It would be the kind of world that God wants us to have, a wonderful world. After all the ice was thawed from my dogs and their coats were dried out, I could see they were all right. I was happy again and felt good all over. One of the hunters said, do you think those hounds are thawed out enough to fight a coon? Sure, just run them out of the tree, I said. At the crack of the gun, the coon ran far out on a big limb and stopped. Again, the hunter sprinkled him with birdshot. This time, he jumped. Hitting the ground, he crouched down. Old Dan made a lunge. Just as he reached him, the old coon sprang straight up and came down on his head. Holding on to his claws, the coon sank his teeth in a long, tender ear. Old Dan was furious. He started turning in a circle, bawling with pain. Little Ann was trying hard to get a hold of the coon, but she couldn't. Because of his fast circling, old Dan's feet flew out from under him, and he fell. This gave little Anne a chance. Darting in, her jaws closed on the back of the coon's neck. I knew the fight was over. Arriving back at camp, I saw that all the tents had been taken down by but ours. A hunter said, everyone was in a hurry to get out before another blizzard sets in. Papa told me to take my dogs to the tent as Grandpa wanted to see them. I saw tears in my grandfather's eyes as he talked to them. His ankle was wrapped in bandages. His foot and toes were swollen to twice their normal size. They had turned a greenish-yellow color. Placing my hand on his foot, I could feel the feverish heat. Dr. Lathman came over. Are you ready to go now? He asked. Snorting and growling, Grandpa said, I told you I wasn't going anywhere until I see the gold cup handed to this boy. Turning to face the crowd, doc Dr. Lathman said, Men, let's get this over. I want to get this man to town. That's one of the meanest sprains I've ever seen, and it should be in a cast, but I don't have any plaster of, of Paris with me. The hunter who had come by our tent collecting the jackpot money came up to me. Handing me the box, he said, Here, you are, son. There's over $300 in this box. It's all yours. Turning to the crowd, he said, Fellows, I can always say this. On this hunt, I've seen two of the finest little coon hounds I ever hoped to see. There was a roar of approval from the crowd. Looking down, I saw the box was almost full of money. I was shaking all over. I tried to say thanks, but it was only a whisper. Turning, I handed the box to my father. As his rough old hands closed around it, I saw a strange look come over his face. He turned and looked at my dogs. Some of the men started shouting, Here it is. 
The crowd parted and the judge walked through. I saw the gleaming metal of the gold cup in his hand. After a short speech, he handed it to me, saying, Son, this makes me very proud. It's a great honor to present you with this championship cup. The crowd exploded. The hunter's shouts were deafening. I don't know from where the two silly old tears came. They just squeezed their way out. I felt them as they rolled down my cheeks. One dropped on the smooth surface of the cup and splattered. I wiped it away with my sleeve. Turning to my dogs, I knelt down and showed the cup to, to them. Little Ann licked it. Old Dan sniffed one time and then turned his head away. The judge said, Son, there's a place on the cup to engrave the names of your dogs. I can take it into Oklahoma City and have it done, or you can have it done yourself. The engraving charge has already been paid by the association. Looking at the cup, it seemed that far down in the gleaming shadows, I could see two wide blue eyes glued to a window pane. I knew that my little sister was watching the road and waiting for our return. Looking back to the judge, I said, If you don't mind, I'll take it with me. My grandfather can send it in for me. Laughing, he said, that's all right. Handing me a slip of paper, he said, this is the address where you should send it. Grandpa said, now that that's settled, I'm ready to go to town. Turning to my papa, he said, you'll have to bring the buggy, and I wish you'd look after my stock. I know Grandma will want to go in with us, and there will be no, no one there to feed them. Tell Bill Lowry to come up and take care of the store. You'll find the keys in the usual place. We'll take care of everything, Papa said. Don't worry about a thing. I don't intend to stop until we get back because it looks like we're in for some more bad weather. I went over and kissed Grandpa goodbye. He pinched my cheek and whispered, We'll teach these city slickers that they can't come up here and beat our dogs. I smiled. Grandpa was carried out and made comfortable in the back seat of Dr. Laughman's car. I stood and watched as it wheezed and bounced its way out of sight. While I'm harnessing the team, Papa said, You take the tent down and pack our gear. On the back seat of the buggy, I made a bed out of our bedclothes. Down on the floorboards, I fixed a nice place for my dogs. All through the night, the creaking wheels of our buggy moved on. Several times I woke up. My father had wrapped a tarp around himself. Reaching down, I could feel my dogs. They were warm and comfortable. Early the next morning, we stopped for breakfast. While Papa tended to the team, I turned my dogs loose and let them stretch. We made good time last night, Papa said. If everything goes right, we'll be home long before dark. Reaching Grandpa's store in the middle of the afternoon, Papa said, I'll put the team in the barn and feed the stock while you unload the buggy. Coming back from the barn, he said, In the morning, I'll go over and tell Bill Lowry to come up and open the store. Looking around, he said, It snowed more here than it did where we were hunting. Feeling big and important, I said, I don't like the looks of this weather. We'd better be scooting for home.